it's kind of cold and there's a little wind and I somehow knew that this was it, that this was the day. And all of a sudden from way across on Central Park West, I see a limo. And I know that that it's him. I have this incredible feeling. I heard a voice in my head saying, do it, do it, do it. And John Lennon's car pulled up. And as he passed me, I pulled out the gun, aimed at his back, and pulled the trigger five times. On Monday the 8th of December 1980, just before 11 p.m., Mark Chapman shot John Lennon outside the former Beatles' New York home. It was a brutal and calculated killing that claimed the life of one of the most popular and influential artists of all time. We took the call, uh, the job, and we went up to, uh, in that direction. I remember telling my partner at the time, I said, B better slow down, this could be the Chinese having their New Year celebration in Central Park. And one of the uh, citizens hollered out to me, watch out, officer, there's somebody firing a gun in there. Then we knew it wasn't firecrackers. So we approached uh, cautiously, you know, and uh, I saw uh, Lennon laying face down on the rug, and he was bleeding profusely. We didn't know who the patient was until we took his wallet out of his pocket as part of the identification. The nurses didn't believe the patient's name until we saw that there was literally about $10,000 in cash in the wallet, and at the same moment, Yoko Ono came into the emergency department. And we knew that we were dealing with the real John Lennon. He had four gunshot wounds, three in the left upper part of his chest and one in the upper part of his left arm. We actually did an operation in the emergency department. We opened Mr. Lennon's chest. We put a large catheter actually into his heart. I held his heart within my hands and pumped it, but we discovered once the chest was open that all of the major blood vessels leading from the heart had been completely destroyed. There would be no way to reconstruct them and no way to save him. My first job was to talk to John Lennon's wife, Yoko Ono. She was lying on the floor, concrete floor, banging her head against the floor saying, no, it's not true. I had to put my hands behind her head for fear that she would harm herself. And as soon as she accepted the fact that her husband was dead, the first thing she said to me was, don't put this out on the TV until I can make certain that my son Sean is not sitting in front of the television. And we agreed to delay the announcement for 20 minutes from that time. John Lennon was brought to the emergency room at the Roosevelt site, St. Luke's Roosevelt Hospital, this evening, shortly before 11 p.m. He was dead on arrival. With Lennon confirmed dead, attention switched to his anonymous assassin. After carrying out what seemed to be a senseless murder, he had simply handed himself over to the police. He did not fit the profile of a violent killer. He was very polite. He never gave us a hard time. In fact, at one point, he even apologized for, uh, for messing up our night. I said, do you know you just messed up your whole life? He just started talking about a little man inside of him and a big man inside of him. Uh, the big man won the battle the last few times, and his inner person told him not to do it. But tonight, the little guy won, and he, uh, he did do it. He put four in him, four or five. 
Mark Chapman pleaded guilty to second-degree murder and was sentenced without trial. There would be no public account of his crime. The only clue to his motive lay in a set of intriguing mementos he left near the murder scene. But 10 years later, Chapman offered one journalist the story of a lifetime. One day I received a short letter asking me to visit him at the prison. When I arrived there, he handed me a note saying that he, you know, it was like a one-sentence statement, I'm sorry I killed John Lennon. And I said, Mark, if you're serious, then we should sit down and talk about it and uh, write something meaningful. And he said, well, I'll pray about that. He never makes the smallest decision without consulting with God. A couple days later, I got another letter saying, come back to the prison. He wanted to sit down and do some interviews. And I remember thinking. Through his prison interviews with disturbed Vietnam War veterans and violent criminals, Jack Jones had gained a reputation as an honest and sympathetic journalist. And I, and I felt. Um, now he had the chance to confront one of the most infamous murderers in modern history. Perhaps my identity would be found in the killing of John Lennon. Chapman's desire for notoriety is well known. But his eagerness to tell his story exposed him to a serious analysis that would, for the first time, provide a convincing account of how and why this man killed John Lennon. The date is March 18th. It is a Monday. And Jack and I have decided to start with perhaps a chronological view uh, of my life and what shaped my identity. Over a period of nine months, journalist Jack Jones recorded and transcribed over a hundred hours of interviews with Mark Chapman. Born in Fort Worth, Texas. Amongst page after page of tedious biographical detail, Jones discovered a remarkably articulate account of the murder of John Lennon. And I remember saying in my mind, what if I killed him? The amount of detail and I think honesty uh, that Mark went into was uh, unique in my experience. No, no, no. No, I want to kill him. I want to kill him. He's mine. I want him. Then the adult. Mark Chapman's reasons for killing John Lennon have remained part of a complicated riddle that has baffled a long list of psychologists and psychiatrists for 25 years. Despite displaying symptoms of virtually every psychiatric ailment in the book, his condition has proved impossible to diagnose. But Jack Jones was different. He spent years recording, analyzing, and researching Chapman's life story. What emerged was a picture of a disturbed personality that Mark Chapman has battled to control for his whole life. For the first time, Jack's tapes tell the real story of the killing of John Lennon, finally making sense of the evidence gathered at the time of the crime. At the scene of John Lennon's murder, Mark Chapman left a signed copy of his victim's latest album. Lennon's killer was a fan. And he had been since he was eight years old. They were coming to the Atlanta Stadium soon, and I don't remember asking my father if I could go, but I do remember asking him to please, please buy me their first record, which was called Meet the Beatles, the, the record that has their four faces on the front. Mark Chapman grew up in a small town at the heart of America's Bible Belt. His childhood was unremarkable. He was a lonely boy who preferred to invent imaginary friends than engage with the real world. But in 1964, just like everyone else in America, Chapman fell in love with the Beatles. 
and in particular with their enigmatic and outspoken founder. For our last number, I'd like to ask your help. Would the people in the cheaper seats clap your hands? <laughs> and the rest of you, if you just rattle your jewelry. John was leader in terms of having a, this commanding personality. It seems a bit silly to be in America and for none of them to mention Vietnam as if nothing was happening. But I mean, you've just got to, you can't just keep quiet about anything that's going on in the world unless you're a monk. As a Beatle, John Lennon was one of the most famous men on the planet. By the end of the 60s, he'd become the voice of a generation. It's quite hard to stay in bed for seven days. I, yes, I did it in India, and it's pretty hard. So we're doing it, and we think we're doing it for world, world peace, yeah. and, and we believe that. This is how you become a saint. When in your personal life, you say the things which other people feel. Peace, peace. As Lennon progressed from lovable rogue to spiritual pioneer, Chapman's admiration became unusually intense. I remember uh, probably the first time I did LSD. And of course, uh, the Beatles now were into psychedelics. They were into Hindu meditation. They were into long hair and beards. And they fit right along with my, with my plans. When he had his first drug experience, he felt like he was home. And I think also uh, he felt like he was more of the kind of person that his hero at that time continued to be, John Lennon. As a child, Mark Chapman had struggled to find his place in the world. But as a teenager, he found recognition as a drug-taking hippie, an identity he drew directly from John Lennon. We were hated, we were looked down upon. We had long hair, we had bell-bottom jeans, we took drugs. We were counterculture inside that high school, let me tell you. What Mark Chapman wanted to be was to be worshipped, like John Lennon was worshipped. He wanted the fame, the power, the admiration, to be recognised. That's what he wanted. And his whole life is motivated by wanting um, an identity of fame and notoriety. Chapman's hippie phase was the first chapter in a desperate, lifelong search for recognition. I'm going to center on an incident that really... And it's an early sign of a defective personality type that is betrayed in every one of thousands of pages of his interview transcripts by one crucial characteristic. This is what happened. It's quite striking in the transcripts, the level of narcissism. I felt I had really found something. I'd found the quote answer. They're completely lacking in any kind of emotional depth. I was angry at... The transcripts are, I did this, I did that. It's I, 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 I. That's how I was. I was that way too. But this narcissistic self-obsession is symptomatic of a specific type of disturbed personality. The counteraction of that. One way to think about narcissistic personality disorder is that it is, at its core, caused by very poor self-esteem. And then what gets uh, constructed to protect against this is its opposite a very grandiose and narcissistic um, behavioral pattern and uh, internal state. But it's very fragile, because underneath, there's, there's this knowledge, whether conscious or not, of being very defective. Throughout his life, Chapman's flawed personality would repeatedly pitch him between happiness and despair. It was a character defect epitomized by one minor incident in the summer of 1971 that obliterated his hippie persona and took his life on a wholly different path. I had met up with some people on the beach and, uh, and I realized somebody had gone through my wallet. And I cannot tell you how deeply that hurt me. I just remember just feeling the very lowest I'd ever felt, this totally useless self-esteem, just smashed under a giant concrete pillar. I think at that point, I really started thinking I was really a nothing, really a nobody. One of the characteristics of 
a narcissistic personality, is hypersensitivity. Individuals will take everything very personally. They get very depressed, they can't understand why. And I'm such a, a special person, why is this not going right for me? Mark Chapman's desperate insecurity would make any stable sense of self-esteem impossible to sustain. And on the very evening of what seemed to him a devastating betrayal, he ditched his hippie lifestyle and simply moved on to find a new, even more fanatical identity. I remember I was lying back on the sofa, feeling like I was nothing, like I was nobody. And I remember I lifted my hands and I said, Jesus, you know, come to me, help me. I called out for Christ in that room. He was there in that room with me. And I felt the whole insides of me transformed. I felt I had really found something. Mark has always been larger than, I think, even God in his own mind. I think that's the, the sort of narcissistic hallmark that uh, from that point, Mark believed himself to be the world's greatest Christian and thought of himself as a you know, Christ-like figure. The biggest hippie in town had been born again, and there was no room in Chapman's new life for his former idol, who just a few years earlier had claimed to be more popular than Jesus. Mark's friends at that time remembered him singing to the tune, Imagine, Imagine John Lennon is dead. You know, this is 10 years before he actually took the man's life. When the police traced the hotel room from which Mark Chapman had plotted John Lennon's murder, they found a Bible to which Chapman had made a personal amendment. Next to the Bible, Chapman left a set of photographs. They were taken while he was working on a series of vacation jobs with the YMCA, looking after Vietnamese refugees. He was 20, and this was the happiest time of his troubled life. Probably one of the greatest moments of my life, I was sitting with my kids. They were giving the most honorable counselor award, and I remember my name was called, and everybody clapped, and my kids were real excited. I went up and shook the director's hand, and it just made me feel really, really good. He had an audience of kids who worshipped him. He was, uh, you know, at that point in his life, he was anybody you talked to who knew him, he was, he was magical with children. The adoration of a group of deprived children was a perfect fit for Chapman's narcissistic character. But his constant need for recognition made it impossible to sustain any sense of belonging in the adult world. I think the most striking contradiction I found when I started talking to people about him was no one could believe that Mark David Chapman had done this. A lot of people who had worked with him said, no, that could not possibly be Mark. Uh, he would do anything to please me, one of his bosses told me. He would do anything to please me. When I heard that the first time, I thought, well, this is an extraordinary contradiction. The more and more I heard it, the more I realized that his eagerness to please masked this pathetic insecurity. At 21, Chapman enrolled at college. An unexceptional student with average grades, he made little impression on his peers or tutors. He dropped out after just one term and took a series of part-time jobs as a security guard. You might get a stereotype of me by hearing that I was a security guard. I mean, most security guards aren't too bright. They can't work elsewhere. With me, it was kind of a, it was an escape kind of a thing because probably my self-esteem had just been so crushed I couldn't handle anything else. Once uh, people stopped making him sort of the center of attention, he became severely depressed again. Chapman craved recognition and finding himself an anonymous nobody in a dead-end job, he dreamt up a grand adventure that would take him to Hawaii and put an end to his misery. Going to Hawaii was, was like kind of... I 
exotic. It was escape from the world I was in right then, but it was also escape from life. I wanted to die. I mean, I really did want to die. On the 20th of June, 1977, on the north shore of Honolulu, Mark Chapman tried to take his own life, but it was a pathetic failure. More a cry for help than a serious suicide attempt. And sure enough, he soon found himself once again the center of attention. He very eagerly went into treatment at a psychiatric hospital. And within uh, a matter of weeks, uh, you know, this young man who supposedly had been suicidally depressed had, uh, you know, rebounded and was literally working with other patients. Despite being diagnosed with acute depressive illness, Chapman made a remarkable recovery. He endeared himself to the medical staff and was soon counseling his fellow patients. After his discharge, he was rewarded with a job in the hospital's housekeeping department. I would hear my name paged constantly all day. And uh, I was just all around the hospital. Everybody knew me. Um, I was feeling my self-esteem coming back. But hospital menial work couldn't possibly deliver the level of esteem he craved. And despite marrying Gloria Abe, a local travel agent, and settling down to a normal life in Hawaii, Mark's depression soon returned, and his desperate search for a stable sense of identity resumed. And in a library in Hawaii, he discovered his next, most extreme alter ego, in the pages of the classic American novel, The Catcher in the Rye. He would be clutching a paperback copy of this book when, just two months later, he was arrested for murdering John Lennon. I believe I found in the reading of The Catch in the Rye a small anchor that even if I was still pulled around, I wasn't pulled around as fast. Published in 1951, J.D. Selinger's The Catcher in the Rye tells the story of teenager Holden Caulfield. Expelled from prep school, he embarks on a two-day journey through his native New York, ruthlessly mocking the hypocrisy of the adult world around him. For generations to come, Holden would represent the archetypal alienated adolescent. For Mark Chapman, he was the ultimate role model. Chapman was attracted to the catcher and the rye because he saw it as a statement about a form of innocence. He doesn't simply read it for that kind of very easy, maverick, rebellious uh, kind of teenage sense of, of having a laugh, which is part of what the book is about. He also taps into the darker side of the book, seeing the world as an intensely corrupt kind of place. The paragraphs and the sentences of that book were flowing through my veins, and they were entering my brain and my thoughts and my, my actions, and my, my very soul was breathing between the pages of The Catcher in the Rye. He identified with the character in, in that book with the sense of being uh, misunderstood and isolated and feeling better than everyone else. They both see themselves as people who are set very firmly against what they consider to be the phoniness, the corruption of the world in which they're living. I was angry at people and I was angry at their phoniness that everybody was just like afraid of being who they were and saying what they thought and, and giving out their feelings. In the months leading up to December 1980, Mark Chapman became completely consumed by Holden Caulfield and his rage against hypocrites and phonies. And two weeks after discovering the catcher in the rye, he found a target for his fury in the pages of another book. By October 1980, 
diagnosed with suicidal depression and crippled by his defective personality, Mark Chapman had turned his back on reality and escaped into a world of books. He became obsessed with the Catcher in the Rye and its anti-hero Holden Caulfield. And two weeks after discovering Holden, he would become fixated with another character he found in the pages of a library book. This time, a real person. Going down an aisle, not looking for any book particular, I came across One Day at a Time by Anthony Fawcett. Since his Christian conversion nearly 10 years before, Chapman had all but forgotten about John Lennon. Now the man he once worshipped triggered a terrible rage. He sees this photograph of John Lennon and this represents to him a man of success. He's smiling, he's happy, he's relaxed, he's on the top of the world. And Mark Chapman is full of envy about this man. He has what he wants. He wants to be worshipped, like John Lennon was worshipped. There was a successful man who kind of had the world on a chain, so to speak. And there I was, not even a link of that chain. And something in me just broke. Incensed by John Lennon's lifestyle, Chapman transposed Holden Caulfield's private war against hypocrites and phonies onto his former idol. One of the things that, that Chapman dislikes about Lennon in the 1970s is that he's become rich, he's become a phony. So in a sense, Chapman wants to preserve Lennon in a kind of timeless world, as someone who is the voice of authenticity, as he was, according to Chapman, in the 1960s. Alone, at home in his apartment in Hawaii, Mark Chapman conceived a dreadfully simple response to his mounting anger. I was sitting cross-legged on the carpet of my uh, apartment. The Lennon book that I checked out was on the coffee table. And I remember opening up the Sgt. Pepper album And I remember just seeing what I perceived to be the phoniness of Lennon in the, in the Fawcett book versus the Lennon that I had known, the Lennon that I had practically worshipped as, as a Beatle. And just seeing these terrible inconsistencies. And I remember saying in my mind, what if I killed him? And I remember thinking, perhaps my identity would be found in the killing of John Lennon. Mark Chapman was a Christian. He had no criminal record and no history of violent behavior. He would need help if he was to realize his awful ambition. He had found his identity in a fictional character. Now he turned to a fantasy world of little people he had invented when he was seven years old. I remember my parents got me this cutout book. And I remember I tore them out of the book and set them up. And I remember I used to play with them along the floor. Perhaps that is when the little people, the little world, came into my very imaginative mind. As Mark's depressive episodes grew more severe, he became increasingly detached from reality. And just as John Lennon re-entered his life, the little people returned. I was working long hours as a security guard, and I can't remember a specific hour or a day or moment, but it did come back. and. I guess a more adult version of the imaginary world than from the early days. I guess I was like the president, where they were my subjects, and uh, I would speak with them through means of television, through imaginary television. He called one of them, I think, the chief of staff, and another um, the head of defense. 
So in his own internal world, he made himself a special person who was superior to every other aspect of his personality. Usually people will tell you that uh, little people told them to kill somebody or told them to burn that person or hurt that person or stab that person. You read about that in the paper all the time. My little people didn't want me to, to do any harm to anybody because uh, they were appalled when they were informed that uh, I wanted to murder John Lennon. And uh, they shortly dissolved afterwards. When Mark's little people abandoned him, he simply summoned a new set of more sinister, make-believe advisors. I would say I had sessions trying to invoke the devil's assistance probably three or four times, calling out to the devil, give me the opportunity. I remember those exact words, give me the opportunity to kill John Lennon. His personality had become cleanly split into two halves. Uh, one he called an evil child. The other he called the phony adult. And it was the child who had taken control. The child was praying to the devil, and the adult was praying to the Lord. God, help me. Save me, God, from this. No, no, no. The devil, help me. Help me, devil, help me. Give me the power and the strength to do this. I want to be important. I want to be somebody. Nobody ever let me be anybody. I couldn't be anybody. I failed at everything. Please, I want this. I want this so bad, so bad. The spiritual dichotomy, the devil, God, and the inner dichotomy, the child and the man. Some people might describe the state that he was in at that time as schizophrenic, but uh, I think to be schizophrenic, you have to be out of touch with what you're doing. And Mark was never really out of touch. He, he was trying to convince himself as well as the rest of the world uh, that he was insane. I was under total compulsion. I just, I'm thoroughly convinced in my heart that I, there was nothing I could do beyond that point to help myself. Totally convinced of that. There's no, it was like a, a, a train, a runaway train. There was no stopping it. No matter, nothing could have stopped me. On the 23rd of October, 1980, in New York, John Lennon released Starting Over the debut single from his first album for nearly five years. Later that day, Mark Chapman left his job as a security guard in a Hawaiian apartment block for the last time. He signed out as John Lennon. Four days later, he bought a gun, and the following week, he set off for New York. Throughout this entire tragedy, there was one person that was in control of everything, and that's Mark Chapman. There's all the different nationalities here. And uh, sometimes in the summer, it's like being in Calcutta or something. You can cut the, the heat with a knife, right? And you're always hearing congas going on in the park all the time. It's like a festival going on. Since the acrimonious breakup of the Beatles in 1970, John Lennon and his wife, Yoko Ono, had made their home in New York City. I think it's fairly understood that John Lennon loved living in New York because he could wander around in a way that he couldn't in England. That was a freedom that he hadn't had since 1963, which was a great gift, you know, to be able to just wander around like a human being, you know? But after the birth of his second son, Sean, John Lennon disappeared from public life. In the middle of 75, he puts out his last studio album for what turns out to be five years, and almost immediately goes into this hermetic life. But just two months before his murder, 
Lennon launched an eagerly awaited comeback. They'd had the child, Sean, you know. What else is he going to do? He'd spent years and years and years in his bedroom just getting stoned, you know? So it was great to see John Lennon back. On the 1st of November, 1980, Mark Chapman arrived in New York. Compelled by his lifelong craving for fame and inspired by his obsession with the catcher in the rye, he had come to make a name for himself as a real-life Holden Caulfield. You have to understand, I don't think I truly thought I was doing anything evil. I thought I was good, that this was a white knight kind of a thing, a crusade. He's creating a play, and there's only one actor in the play. He's centre stage. It's, it's pure self-indulgence. He's rewriting history and saying, the most important person in this drama is me. Instead of seeking out John Lennon, Mark Chapman spent his time acting out episodes from The Catcher in the Rye. In his mind, he was becoming his fictional hero. I remember actually feeling that after shooting Lennon, I would become Holden Caulfield. Despite staying in New York for over three weeks, Chapman neither sought nor found John Lennon. But he returned on Saturday the 6th of December, 1980. And this time, after checking into his hotel, he went straight to John and Yoko's iconic New York home. They got this apartment in the Dakota building, which is this gothic pile overlooking Central Park. I walked to the Dakota building and pretty well ascertained that Lennon was in the building. I remember feeling a little bit of exhilaration that it had been confirmed for me that he was there. For two days, Mark Chapman waited patiently in vain, but he knew that John Lennon was in New York. Chapman spent Sunday night with a prostitute, an encounter he lifted directly from the pages of The Catcher in the Rye. And on the morning of Monday, the 8th of December, he prepared to leave his hotel room for the last time. I somehow knew that this was it, that this was the day. So I laid a leather Bible out uh, that I had turned to the Gospel of John and I wrote the Gospel of John Lennon. My passport, two pictures of me with Vietnamese refugees, no letter of intent or anything of that nature, just a tableau of everything that was important in my life. So it would look, I said, look, this is me. Probably this is the real me. And well, I left the room. But one crucial piece of Chapman's cryptic jigsaw was missing. I walked over to a bookstore and I went in and I found on the bottom row a copy of the paperback Catch the Rye and um, wrote, this is my statement and underlining the word this. As Chapman resumed his vigil outside the Dakota building, clutching his precious book, John Lennon was inside, working on the promotion of his new record. Chapman had scripted every detail of his dramatic plot, but the next episode took him completely by surprise. He's outside the Dakota. He has his 38 revolver with him, and he also has a, a copy of Double Fantasy, the most recent album of John and Yoko. And uh, he's there with a, a photographer, a man named Paul Goresh, who takes a photo of the incident. All of a sudden, Paul shouted to me, he says, he's coming, he's coming. You have to understand that my heart was beating pretty, pretty rapidly, and uh, here I was in front of John Lennon, and I was kind of tongue-tied. I 
and said, uh, John, would you sign my album? And he was very, very kind to me. And he said, is that all you want? Like, just like that. And I said, yeah. I said, thanks, John. He's standing there while this is going on with a gun in his pocket. There was his target, and he had no urge or instinct to reach for the gun. Lennon had come face to face with his killer. Chapman was momentarily bewildered, but determined that the next time he would be ready. And as night fell, he was left alone, except for the voices inside his head. And the child was praying to the devil, and the adult was praying to the Lord. And the adult wants to go home, and the child, no, no, no! No, I want to kill him! I want to kill him! When he was left alone with only, you know, the evil insanity that he had conjured, uh, it was all over. Just after 10.30 p.m. on Monday, the 8th of December, 1980, John Lennon and Yoko Ono left a recording studio on the west side of New York and headed for home, where Mark Chapman was waiting. I'm sitting in midway in the tunnel of the entrance of the Dakota on the little curb on the left. And all of a sudden, from way across on Central Park West, I see a limo. And I know that, that it's him. I, I have this incredible feeling. I stood up hands in my pocket and John Lennon's car pulled up I remember Yoko got out and then John Lennon followed about 20 30 feet behind her and as he looked at me and I looked at him I, I nodded and I think he recognized me I heard a voice in my head saying, do it, do it, do it. And as he passed me, I pulled out the gun, aimed at his back, and pulled the trigger five times in succession. It's now 14 hours since John Lennon was shot here at the entrance to the Dakota building on West 72nd Street in the center of New York. Here all night, and in those others have just hours, drifted away from their office for half an hour or so. Turning the gates of this old apartment building into a whatsoever. kind of a shrine. As for the suspect, nobody knows why he came to New York in the first place or indeed what the motive was in what seems to be a totally senseless killing. In the days following John Lennon's death, Mark Chapman claimed that the murder was a deliberate act, calculated to publicize the catcher in the rye. The book became the reason John Lennon was killed. Not my confusion, not my trigger finger, but the book. In his own mind, Chapman had taken the life of the man that he claimed was a hypocritical phony. He had also ended his lifelong search for notoriety. He's a nobody who wants to be somebody. He desperately, so desperately wants to be somebody, and he'll almost do anything to achieve it, and he did. Mark Chapman was sentenced to a minimum of 25 years, maximum life in jail. 
with several parole appeals rejected, he remains a prisoner in Attica Correctional Facility near Buffalo in New York State, where he faces the rest of his life behind bars. I read the Bible every day now, I pray every day now, I give every factor of my life to the Lord. When he began talking to journalist Jack Jones, Mark Chapman's aim was to tell the world that he was sorry. But his interviews suggest that the disturbed personality that drove him to murder 25 years ago remains unchanged. And I feel like I've finally got a grasp on my life now. We have to take his words within the context of who he is, what he has done, and uh, realize that he is still, uh, to a large degree, a very narcissistic, egotistical person uh, who needs to feel that he is in control. I'm, I'm a healed man. I'm a spiritual man. I'm a man who's gone through battles with demons. There's no sense of any consideration of anybody else's feelings. My own spirituality. There's no remorse. There's no guilt. I've come out uh, a whole egg again. All and that's there I, are I is pages and pages and pages of justification for his actions. I'm in prison. According to society, I'm paying for my crime. But I know that God has forgiven me for the eternal penalty of that, and I'm very grateful to him for that. I think we better take a break. John Lennon died a horrible death. Those bullets ripped through his insides, you know, tore out his vocal cords. And in the last moments, a man, you know, there's, well, there's this voice of a generation that couldn't even speak his own name. I don't think Mark can fully grasp the absolute enormity of what he did. Peter. 